So we start now with the program after the welcome speeches. So we are going to talk today about the strategy in fight against doping. We are facing the World Cup 2014 in Brazil. The laboratory received the revocation in uh, Rio de Janeiro. It's a big challenge because now we have to see that it's for the first time that in the country where we are organizing the FIFA World Cup, we do not have the laboratory. We are, of course, not very happy about that. It has been mentioned by both previous speakers that we have a number of problems in football and in general in sport. The biggest one is the illegal betting and doping. When those two get together as a partners, then we really will face problems. And we have some indication from the intelligence that those two groups who are supporting the development of doping, they are very similar, if not the same, who are also supporting and organizing the illegal betting. For us, and that was the slogan at the World Cup 2010, thank you, David, for the idea, say no to doping, and we have promoted during the entire World Cup, and we will do the same also 2014. It has been mentioned, 1960, this tragic death of Knut Jensen, that was the first time when the public has been shaken. Next time, 84, against a big shaking and big shock. We had also a shock and we took the lesson 1994 with expelling Maradona, the best player from the World Cup in the uh, United States. And it gave us the lesson. We have to invest more in the prevention and in the education. Well, of course, we have the black sheep in our profession and we have to identify them and eliminate from the medical profession. I will come to this a little later. We have the athletes who were systematically doing or still doing under the, another black sheep of our profession and also those we have to identify. And finally, we have the high professional, very skilled person who knew how to manipulate everything, including the molecules of erythropoietin. As mentioned, FIFA introduced the regulations, the anti-doping regulations, 1966. That was the World Cup in England. We have found the original of those anti-doping regulations from 1966. It's quite an impressive document. It, it was very well written. But the interesting, and this is for you, Alan Werneck and David Homan, that was the list of prohibited substances, seven. Some of them are still on the, on the list, but I think we should, from the current list, we should really look very carefully what has to remain there and what could be removed because it is not proven that it has any performance enhancing uh, abilities and make it feasible for the daily life and identify what is the problem. 1966, they knew amphetamine was a problem, the strychnine was a problem, phenmetrazine, I remember that as a medical student in Prague, that was the drug of, uh, that was very modern drug, phenmetrazine, that is in the past, now it's, uh, there are other stimulants which replace. But it's interesting to see how it all started. During the Olympic Games 2000, we have realized that there is a um, difference between the individual athletes and the athletes in team sports. And we thought that we should discuss together with the IOC the common problems or common issues, and one of them was doping and the other one was the prevention of injuries. 2003, some of you have been in Copenhagen at the um, BADA conference. It was a very important when the World Anti-Doping Code has been um, introduced. And I found when we, I was preparing for this meeting some slides from that time which we presented to BADA 2003 in, um, in Copenhagen. The Olympic Team Sports Federation perspective on the strategy in fight against doping what has changed, improved, 
and what could be done in collaboration with the IOC and WADA. And when I looked on the next uh, proposal, which we given to the audience in Johannesburg, we didn't have the opportunity to address the audience, but in Copenhagen we had this joint um, statement from the Team Sports Federation. We mentioned, let's develop jointly a global long-term strategy of education and control procedures, jointly with all involved parties, defined jointly in advance, and this is important, and I still am convinced that this would be important also for the future, in advance, according to available financial funds of International Federation, IOC, World Anti-Doping Agency, and government, the total amount of annual in and out of competition doping controls. It is not regulated now. We have to realize that it's just increasing, but it's depending on each of us who are responsible for the anti-doping organization to decide whom, when, how many, and how much we invest. Determine the number of required medical officers and laboratory capacity around the world total and divide into the regions. Let's face the reality. Most of the sampling procedures are done today in Europe. That's the highest density of the laboratories. You go to Africa, we have one, maybe soon two laboratories. So it's clearly defined that most of the sampling procedures are done in Europe and we should be thinking how to divide equally around the world. And finally, analyze jointly all positive cases to revise the code, if rational, based on the different case reports, just to learn from each other what is the problem to understand the trends. I think on this I wouldn't change anything even though, and this is the last one from 2003, we have realized football alone 300 million, if you take the international rugby board, ice hockey, basketball, handball, volleyball, floor, and other field hockeys, then we are coming probably today close to one billion active athletes. One billion. So we need a strong long-term strategy in the fight against doping by education, through doctors, it is still 2003, exercise physiologists, paramedical personnel. Promote performance improvement by physiological methods, including well-balanced and natural nutritional habits. And this is the most important, and I am still convinced that it is valid today. Credit the medical profession with this task by developing strong international network. I think medical profession has the direct approach to the athletes by, because athletes need us when they are injured or when they are ill. And on the other side, we can give them the education they need. So that was 2003. Now we are looking to the implementation of the World Anti-Doping Code 2015. In Johannesburg, FIFA clearly expressed the support of the new code. But on the other side, it is FIFA's duty to protect the players from harm and ensure that footballers can compete on the same level of playing field. That's absolutely compliant with the Code 2015. But FIFA respect the dignity of private life of each player who is subject to testing. So we are looking for strategies where we can keep the in-team and private life of the players, but also have a system in place that is working and is also deterrent. We base any decision related to anti-doping programs, since we are working with uh, Dr. Michel Doc together since 1994, on the specific of the game, the scientific evidence, which is provided by you, the scientists and laboratory experts, and finally, on the analysis of the doping statistics. And permit me to make some remarks in this respect. 
Thanks to the new organization of the World Anti-Doping Agency as related to the monitoring system from the different laboratories, we have a very good data as related to the amount of controls being done for each particular sport. So we are doing in football somewhere 2005, 23,000, 2012, 28,000. So in those eight years, we are overseeing here in the medical office of FIFA close to quarter million sampling procedures around the world. Quarter million, it's a huge amount. And we process all positive cases or adverse analytical findings. Meanwhile, altogether in those eight years, 752, which accounts for the frequency of 0.33%. Most of the adverse analytical findings or positive cases is on the account of marijuana. And the anabolic steroids over the eight years, we had 93 which is 0.04%. Behind this figure, there is a huge work. And we want to have each case individual assessed. We want to know how the disciplinary committee sanctioned and we inform accordingly the World Anti-Doping Agency. This is a statistics which I prepared for the IOC president, Jacques Roque, 2009. And I made the question, president, does it make sense if we have 2,580,000 sampling procedures in the world and 2,009, 100,000 more, but the absolute figures about the adverse analytical findings, particularly when it comes to the anabolic steroids, it remains more or less the same. It's somewhere between 0.4, 0.4%, but the absolute numbers are around the same. So it doesn't really mean the more you do, the more you catch. It could be. But we have to also think that these 277,000 sampling procedures a year is worth of approximately 300 million US dollar. So now I put in perspective just a the idea for thinking about. I put the statistics 2012, which was released by WADA. In this year, 270,000 uh, sampling procedures, adverse analytical findings, without atypical findings, 3,308. And anabolic steroids, 1,148, when I deduct the elevated testosterone-epitestosterone ratio over four. It accounts for a frequency of 0.4% for anabolic steroids, while in football we have 0.4. Now my question is, who accounts for this tenfold difference? Which sport? And I think we need to know to focus our energy and financial resources there where the problem is. And it is more or less the same over the past eight years. I didn't have time to do it for every year, I just took an example and the representative figures from the past years. We have to clearly define what does that mean risk assessment. And one of the following speakers will talk about this. We need to analyze the data, detailed statistical data on true positive samples. True positive sample mean that it is clearly declared and leads to violation of anti-doping regulation. We need to know the prevalence of prohibited substances of those true positive samples <coughs> in different sports. Different sports might have a different motivation to take a different performance enhancing substances and also see the trend over time. This is how we work in science, in the longitudinal epidemiological studies trends over time. Then present those data statistical data on violation. This is the disciplinary committees of doping control regulations, including sanctions 2005 till 2012. And compare how the different sports are dealing. The World Anti-Doping Code 2015 is foreseeing to have a unified approach to this situation. 
But I think for us who are analyzing the data and who base decisions based upon the data analysis, we need to know. We also clear, and it is not secret, in FIFA World Cup, the last case was Maradona. In the Olympic Games, since uh, we are involved, since 1996, they were positive cases between 14 to 27. Richard, you might correct me. I do not have the exact data. But I say it here. None of them among team sports, all individual athletes. It speaks for itself. We have to focus there where the problem is. So we have to also take a, a little bit of philosophical approach and analyze the so-called doping culture among the different sport. It is justified because then we can also customize the strategy for the future. So a summary and conclusion. The cost efficacy to catch a cheater with anabolic steroids is unfavorable. And I'm just talking, it's not a, um, it's just when I look at the data, and I might be corrected that I read the data not in an appropriate way. In football, we have to spend 2.5 million US dollar to catch one with anabolic steroids. In general, in sport, because it is 10 times more frequent, 250,000. But again, all the other sports, so we, should, we would need to differentiate which sports, where maybe the ratio is one to $10,000 in some sports. The statistical evidence as it is now does not justify future increase of the current sampling programs. This is our opinion. Again, this is subject for discussion in those two days. Blood and urine sampling for longitudinal study of players Hormone profile and steroid might provide an important information. And this is what we are hoping that that might be a new strategy. The analysis of statistical data in the Olympic team sports and individual sport should serve as a basis for the respective future strategies in fight against doping. Risk management must be based on risk assessment. So the biological profile will be discussed here. Now what we have done, and this will be my last one, we understand we have to test, we have to pilot. 2011, 2012, during the Club World Cup, we have examined eight teams as a pilot. 2013, the Club World Cup, we examined all players with blood and urine. They were eight teams. During the, Conf as prior, the Confederation Cup in Brazil, we have examined or tested all players participating in out of competition controls for blood and urine. 2014, we are gearing up to examine all players of the 32 qualified team again for blood and urine. After the World Cup in the database jointly with the UEFA data from the UEFA Champions League players, they have examined several times out and in competition we will have more than 2,000 football players in the database with biological profile. I think this will be a good source of information to share with other international federations and see, and this is the subject of uh, today's um, meeting, that we see if we go a step forward. I skip this. This is something we could talk later on. What are the objectives of the consensus meeting today and tomorrow? Shall we continue in the status quo as up to now? Or time has come to change the strategy in fight against doping? Shall we establish a biological profile following the World Anti-Doping Code 2015 as more effective and deterrent system Samples per at defined samples per athlete per year as a routine control coordination with the team or athlete physicians in all parts of the world. Currently, most of the sampling procedure is done in Europe. And we are 
really convinced that we can be successful through true partnership. Partnership means that my partner brings something which I do not have alone. Partnership between the International Federation's anti-doping units, the IOC anti-doping unit, the national anti-doping organizations, the scientists, you, laboratories. I think without this dialogue with scientists and laboratories, we cannot design the true strategies for future. And finally, in collaboration with the clearinghouse, with um, the World Anti-Doping Agency. So thank you very much for attention in this introduction. And um, Michel, can you introduce the next speaker?